Hi, I'm Amir Hossein Mirza Bozor. And in this video, I want to talk about defining moving load in Avages. This is the table of content. I will talk about ways of defining moving loads in Avages, choosing appropriate steps for simulation, using dynamic explicit step, using dynamic implicit step, and comparison of two steps. Meshing and partitioning the geometry. Example 1, moving of a rigid wheel on a bar, defining the moving load by using subroutines. Example 2, defining loads of a moving six wheel vehicle on an inclined curved path. In many engineering problems, for calculating the exact stress and strain fields, moving loads must be defined in the FE model. For example, in the stress analysis of a bridge or a railway, the dynamic loads that are applied because of moving cars, trucks, trains, and any other kinds of vehicles must be modeled. As the moving vehicles have mass, they have weight. So their weights are moving loads. This weight is transmitted to the bridge or railway by their wheels. Actually, the weight is divided between their wheels. In some cases, we can assume the same pressure applied by wheels to the surface underneath. Moving loads have a direct effect on the fatigue life of structures. For calculating the fatigue life of a bridge, simulations including dynamic loads and moving loads must be performed. Now I want to talk about ways of defining moving loads in abacus. There are two main methods for defining moving load in abacus. The first one is using subroutines and the second one is modeling wheels of the vehicle and the weight applied on wheels. If you want to use subroutines and you want to use Avicus standard solver, you must use deload subroutine. And if you want to use subroutines and Avicus explicit solver, you can use vdload subroutine. Deload subroutine and vdload subroutine are very similar and both of them can be used for defining distributed mechanical loads. In this method, no subroutine is used and we will model wheels of the moving vehicle and apply loads on wheels. Now I want to talk about choosing appropriate steps for simulation. If dynamic loads must be defined in the model, it will be a nonlinear dynamic problem. So nonlinear dynamic steps must be used for simulation. If you want to use Abacus standard solver, you must use dynamic implicit step. And if you want to use Abacus explicit solver, you must use dynamic explicit step. If you want to use dynamic explicit step, you must consider several points. Uh, notice the use of each of these steps have some advantages and some disadvantages and I want to talk about them. As the problem is dynamic and not quasi-static, you must not use the mass scaling factor to increase the time increment size for accelerating the simulation. Actually, the mass scaling factor can only be used for quasi-static problems. As the time increment size is dependent on the mesh size, using very small elements in the path of the moving load will lead to a small time increment size, so do not use very small elements. Actually, the time increment size in dynamic explicit step is dependent on the characteristic length of the element. So, if the element is smaller, the characteristic length will be smaller too, and finally the time increment size will be smaller. Usually there is numerical noise in results obtained by using the dynamic explicit step. 
For removing the noisy results, you can use predefined filters in the visualization module. Usually, the Butterworth filter is the best choice. In the visualization module, there are several predefined filters. Uh, for example, the Butterworth filter, the Chepichev filter, and the SAE filters. But I think that for this kind of problems, the Butterworth filter is the best choice. When you are defining the dynamic explicit step in the mass scaling tab, please do not define any mass scaling factor when you are defining moving loads in a simulation. If you want to use dynamic implicit step, you must consider several points. As the problem is dynamic and not quasi-static, the time increment size of the simulation must be small enough to obtain exact results. Maximum time increment size must be less than the 20% of the time period of wheels cycles. As the time increment size is not dependent on the mesh size, you can use small elements in the path of the moving load. So we can conclude that the dynamic implicit step does not have the disadvantage of dynamic explicit step. As the problem is dynamic and not quasi-static, application setting must be set on moderate dissipation or transient fidelity. Moderate dissipation is a better choice because of leading to a faster convergence and faster simulation. For example, if the angular velocity of the wheel is 100 radian per second, the time period of each cycle of the wheel is this value. And the maximum time increment size must be less than 20% of the time period of the wheel. So the time increment size must be less than this value and the maximum time increment size can be set on 0.01 second. When you are defining dynamic implicit step, in the application setting, choose moderate dissipation. Here I want to compare the dynamic explicit and dynamic implicit steps. As the contact interaction must be defined in this method, some convergency issues may arise in 3D models when using the dynamic implicit step. In some cases, these convergency issues cannot be solved and using the dynamic explicit step is the only choice. As dynamic explicit step can solve even the most complex contact conditions, no issues will arise in using this step, but the results will be noisy. For removing the numerical noise that is inevitable in using this step, filters that are implemented in visualization module can be used. In the previous slide, I talked about it and uh, I said the Butterworth filter is the best choice. I want to talk about meshing and partitioning the geometry. When you are defining moving load, it's better to create a small elements in the path of the moving load. Here, I have defined several partitions to have control on the mesh pattern and the size of elements to create a smaller elements in the path of moving loads. These two regions are path of moving vehicle and here and here we have moving loads. Here you can see the seat pattern of the mesh and you can see that I want to define smaller elements in this region. So from the middle of the surface to the left and right sides, the element size is going to be smaller. In this region, and in this region, smaller elements are created.
In this example, I want to define the moving load along the bar. And I have created a rigid wheel and I applied the load on its reference point. A force with magnitude of 1000 Newton is applied on the wheel. Its velocity along the x-axis is 2 meter per second and its angular velocity is 66.67 radian per second. Actually, no slip condition is assumed and these are the boundary conditions of the bar. I have simulated this example by using both of the dynamic implicit and, and dynamic explicit steps and I have compared them. For comparing the results, I have defined the vertical displacement of this point that is at the middle of the bar as a history output and I will compare the vertical displacement of this point when it is solved by using dynamic explicit step and when it is solved by using dynamic implicit step. This is the vertical displacement of the middle of the bar versus time. The yellow curve is obtained by using dynamic explicit step and the brown curve is obtained by using the dynamic implicit step. You can see that the numerical noise of the result of dynamic explicit step is much bigger than the numerical noise of the dynamic implicit result. So we must use filters for modifying this result. Here I have used the Butterworth filter with the cutoff frequency of 60 Hz for modifying the dynamic explicit result. And here you can see that they are very similar to each other and the trends of both of the curves are very similar and even the values are very close to each other. The difference between the results is because of the mathematical algorithm of each step and it's because of the difference between the procedure of contact simulation. Here I want to show you how to apply filter to the results. In model 2, I have used dynamic implicit step. And in model 3, I have used dynamic explicit step. And I have defined a set from the middle of the bar. And I have defined history output for the vertical displacement of this set. I have defined contact between the wheel and the top surface of the bar. And I have defined rigid body constraint for the wheel. I have defined load on the reference point of the wheel. Velocity of the wheel along the x-axis and its angular velocity. Notice to the negative sign of the angular velocity. As we have assumed the no slip condition in this problem, the direction of angular velocity must be consistent to the direction of the velocity. So here I have used negative sign. And I have defined boundary condition for the bar. And this is the mesh of the wheel. It is solved by using both of the dynamic explicit and dynamic implicit 
steps. You can see the noisy result. Now I want to apply filter to this result. I save it. I want to use Butterworth filter. When you want to choose an appropriate cutoff frequency, uh, you must make some trial and errors. At first, I start with a large cutoff frequency, for example, 500 Hertz. Here you can see that uh, there is no uh, meaningful change in the result and uh, still we have numerical noise. I decrease the cutoff frequency and plot it again. And I decrease it for another time. Here you can see that the amplitude of the noise is decreasing. And I use a smaller cutoff frequency it's better and I choose 60 Hertz and I save it I go back to slides. I want to talk about defining the moving load by using subroutines. When we want to use subroutines, we do not model wheels of the moving vehicle. And we assume an effective area for each of the wheels and the pressure is applied on the effective areas. As the vehicle is moving, all of the effective areas are moving too, and we must define these moving regions in the subroutine. This is one of the moving areas, and this is the position vector of the center of it. And this is the global coordinate system in the assembly module. The subroutine must be written according to the global coordinate system. The effective area of applied pressure of each wheel has its own geometry and has a velocity and direction. If the vehicle is moving in a direct path, the velocity of all of the effective areas are the same. In the subroutine, the moving geometric boundaries of the effective areas must be coded by using if statements. So in all of the points on the surface, the pressure is zero except the regions that are in the effective areas. In this example, I have defined loads of a moving six-wheel vehicle on an inclined curved path. Here you can see the curvature of the path and it has a slope. I have defined four partitions to control the size of elements and their pattern. For solving this example, I have used dynamic implicit step and the deload subroutine. And here you can see the effect of each wheel. We have six wheels and here we have six regions. The vehicle has three axes. As the pressure of the tires of the first axis are less than the pressure of the second and third axis, a smaller stress is calculated in their effective area. 
I want to show you the result of this simulation. Um, for better understanding, I modify the settings of the viewport. The vehicle is moving. I want to show you the subroutine of this simulation. I have written deload subroutine. At first, I have defined the constant parameters and then I have used if a statement for each wheel wheel 1, wheel 2, wheel 3, wheel 4, wheel 5, and wheel 6. You can contact me by using Telegram and WhatsApp or send email to me. We can have one-on-one -on -one tutoring on the AnyDesk WhatsApp and make special videos to your order and we can perform high quality simulations for your thesis exercises and industrial projects thank you so much goodbye